Hi guys, so here it is, our first video. I want to talk about Kitcher's chapter on well-ordered science. So Kitcher, as you remember, is trying to offer a theory of what the relationship between science and politics, or what the role of science is in a democratic society, ideally, in a perfect world. Okay. Um, and the way that he does this is to describe this ideal. He describes this ideal, well-ordered science. Okay. Um, the way that he sort of works his way into this discussion is first to describe something different. He's, first he says, well, here's one way that you could make decisions about scientific research in a society. Uh, you could do what he calls vulgar democracy, where a bunch of people, you know, the whole society, I guess, get together and they vote on which experiments to perform, which theories to investigate, which research agendas pr to pursue. And um, you could imagine what the objections to vulgar democracy are. On the one hand, he says it would be a tyranny of the ignorant, uh, because uh, most people don't actually know anything about uh, most experiments or most research agendas, so why should they have a vote on something that they totally don't understand. You could also imagine that, you know, people's sort of ordinary interests are sort of fleeting, you know, that they would they would be interested in sort of hot topics. They would be interested in, you know, whatever everybody's talking about today, whatever is fashionable today, but then they would forget about it tomorrow. Okay, so vulgar democracy is a non-starter, is a bad idea, he argues, I think, pretty compellingly, for uh, how uh, scientific decisions should be made in a democratic society. Um, so what's the alternative? Well, he offers, by way of sort of, you know, getting you warmed up to the idea, he offers an analogy to a family getting together and trying to figure out what to do for the evening, what the evening's entertainment will be. And um, you could imagine how a family, you know, like a nice family, <laughs> a well-ordered family, a high-functioning family, would make such a decision. All of the people would get together and they would um, express what they were interested in doing. They would express their preferences. They would discuss their possible plans. Their family members, so that they, they you know, they care about each other and so they are, you know, going to you know, not just spite each other and, you know, pursue uh, family plans that are, you know, <laughs> just to, you know, piss off their, your brother or sister or your mom or your dad or whatever. Um, um, uh, they would sort of shape their preferences and shape their ideas about what sounds fun uh, in light of what other people would say, and eventually, you know, maybe through some kind of vote, maybe through just sort of naturally coming to a consensus, maybe through some sort of compromise, they would come to their conclusion about what they should do for the evening. Okay. Um, he says, we can imagine scientific decisions being made in a society sort of on analogy with this family entertainment decision. Uh, so. I'm going to gloss over a lot of the details, but um, I'll say that Kitcher thinks that scientific decision making should be broken up into three phases. At the first phase, um, people in a well-ordered, in well-ordered science, people in a society get together and they share their goals with each other. What are they interested in? What do they want to learn about? What sort of practical, medical, technological uh, consequences do they want to, you know, get out of scientific inquiry? And, you know, we're all members of the same society, so we're all going to be cooperative the same way that the family is going to be cooperative. And um, the uh, then, you know, the scientific experts will get together and say, uh, well, here are the different research agendas we can pursue, and here are the different experiments and theories and um, uh, research programs we could pursue, and uh, here are the likelihoods that each of these research agendas will uh, promote the various goals that you have uh, expressed, the various preferences, the various desires for, for what people want out of science. Um, so you, uh, you have the community-defined goals, the expert-defined uh, probabilities that uh, various research agendas will satisfy those goals, and then through 
just like in the family case, either consensus or voting or compromise, uh, we will come to some way of assigning a distribution of resources, you know, money and stuff, to these various research agendas to satisfy our goals in the most efficient way possible. Okay, that's phase one, um, uh, deciding on what our goals are and which research agendas are uh, best suited to pursuing those goals. Phase two is describing what are the moral constraints on inquiry. So um, some types of uh, inquiry I think we can all agree or every reasonable person can agree are abhorrent. So, um, you know, the experiments conducted by Nazi doctors on disabled people and on Jews, the uh, 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 experiments conducted by the uh, uh, United States military on uh, giving uh, syphilis to people and so on. These sorts of experiments, you know, giving people syphilis without their consent, torturing people uh, because they're members of a despised uh, ethnic minority or in a despised ability status. You know, we any reasonable person in 2020 can agree these are no good. Other sorts of moral constraints on inquiry are a little bit more um, uh, controversial. So you might have some sort of sacred beliefs that you don't want your uh, you don't want inquiry to interfere with. Um, those could be religious beliefs. Um, uh, perhaps your sacred beliefs could be uh, a sort of ideology like uh, Maoism in the uh, case of uh, the Cultural Revolution. Okay, so we would, uh, in a similar process through open deliberation about what our different moral goals are, what our different moral values are, and with some understanding that we live in a pluralistic society and we kind of have to let, to some extent, we have to let people have different <laughs> values and uh, uh, you know acknowledge that other people have moral values that we don't. Um, uh, we will, through the similar process of kind of open deliberation, figure out the moral constraints on inquiry. And lastly, and you know, most simply, we have to apply the knowledge that we've acquired through the research agendas we've, we've um, uh, pursued, uh, subject to the moral constraints we've agreed on. And you know, application will mean, uh, in some cases, the development of new technologies, which is also subject to some moral constraints. In some cases, it'll just be a matter of uh, communicating new scientific knowledge to the public um, through, you know, science journalism and stuff like that. Okay, so um, at each phase, there is a great emphasis on sort of cooperation and uh, a sort of free and open exchange of information, both about our own values and about the likely consequences of various scientific research programs. Okay, good. Um, skipping over a lot in Kitcher's paper, uh, there's, that's, th that's the main idea. Then you can sort of apply this ideal of well-ordered science. You can use it to evaluate actually existing societies by asking yourself, well, how well does this society approximate or um, get close to uh, the uh, ideal of well-ordered science. And you could say, well, the Ch uh, China during the Cultural Revolution, you know, gets this close, and China today gets this close, and the US today gets this close, or whatever it is. Okay. Um, I want to raise some possible objections to Kitcher's uh, con conception of well-ordered science, um, because I think, um, this is, he's talking about something very important, and it's important that we get uh, the ideals right. If well-ordered science is the right ideal, that's important. If well-ordered science is not the right ideal, uh, that's also important. Going to bring in the objection owl to consider some possible objections. Okay. The first objection is to that, that opening analogy between the uh, family making decisions about what form of entertainment to pursue for the evening and the uh, problem of making scientific decisions in a democratic society. One way that that analogy breaks down is that uh, in the family entertainment case, the people 
who are actually enjoying the entertainment <laughs> and the people who are, you know, voting on and discussing their various options are the same. It's just the family members. In the case of scientific decision making, it's the, uh, the scientists and the people who are making decisions about their research are not the same. Um, and so you might think uh, that, you know, maybe the scientists need some more autonomy. They need the ability to make decisions for themselves, not subject to the desires and whims of the wider society. Okay, um, that's one possible objection. You could say the family entertainment analogy breaks down, and when you see how it breaks down, perhaps that suggests that uh, uh, scientific decision-making, even in an ideal world, would uh, uh, give scientists more autonomy, okay, more independence than, uh, than Kitcher's well-ordered science would give them. Okay. Um, another possible concern has to do with uh, what are called externalities in economics. So externalities are costs for some transaction which are paid by people who are not parties to that transaction. So if I am, you know, uh, 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 buying a pack of cigarettes from a grocery store and then I go home and smoke it, well, in a sense, my the costs of that transaction are paid by the people around me. Nobody wants to be around me when I'm smoking and, uh, you know, uh, when I get sick, the uh, uh, people who share my insurance plan have to pay for my uh, medical treatment. And you could say, you know, that's not fair because this is, this is I, I'm imposing a cost, an externality on people who aren't a party to this initial transaction of me paying for the pack of cigarettes. Okay. Um, Kitcher points out that there are externalities to scientific research as well. I should say some externalities are negative. They are costs that are paid by other people. Some externalities are positive. They're benefits that accrue to other people. Um, um, so the Kitcher's solution is to say, well, okay, people who are sort of, uh, there's the democratic society which is making its decisions about how to allocate resources to various research agendas, but um, there's also the people who are outside of that society who are affected by, by that scientific research. And the solution to this problem of externalities is to have them represented somehow in that um, uh, scientific decision-making process. I mean, they send some ambassadors or something to participate in the process of deliberation involved in well-ordered science. Um, but notice that there are some uh, externalities. There are some costs which uh, um, uh, we can't deal with in this way. So, for example, some scientific research comes at the cost of non-human animals. Experimentation on non-human animals, that, that involves a big externality. Except you can't have, you know, the lab mice and uh, lab bunnies who uh, send emissaries to the uh, uh, ideal deliberation panels involved in well-ordered science because mice and bunnies don't, uh, you know, speak human language. Um, similarly, uh, scientific research has costs and benefits for future generations of people, people who don't exist yet. In fact, you might say most of the costs and benefits of current scientific research are costs and benefits that will be paid for or paid to uh, future people, people who don't exist yet, at least as long as the human race sticks around for a little while. And so um, those people can't be, uh, uh, their interests can't be sort of reflected in the process of, of well-ordered science. I think um, um, one uh, solution to this problem would be to say, well, let's give up on this whole democratic thing altogether and just say that um, uh, what uh, moral philosophers who are called utilitarians would say, and just say that the best use of our scientific resources is the use that causes the greatest total amount of happiness or well-being for everybody in the world, non-human animals, human beings, and also future humans who don't exist yet. Um, and so however we achieve that uh, through some kind of democratic process, through uh, giving scientists the total autonomy to make decisions about their research or some other way, um, 
the goal should be a utilitarian goal, and that would deal with the externalities that Kitcher has ignored. Okay, so much for the objections. Uh, thanks for listening. I'll see you guys next week.